Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. While we wait for some people to hop in, why don't y'all drop in the chat and let us know where you're calling in from? New Jersey. Nice. Awesome. Brooklyn, Chicago, Houston, Washington. Wow, they're coming in fast. Y'all are speeding all at the same time. Cool. Welcome, everybody. Looks like we got a little bit of everywhere. Awesome. Cool. So we are conscious of time. We are currently at 10.03, so we're going to go ahead and kick things off. Welcome to your monthly MCJ and Climate People Career Advancement Session. We're so excited to see so many new faces this month. It's super exciting to see those registration numbers go up and up and up. So yeah, thank you all for taking an hour out of your Wednesday to be here. I think I said Tuesday earlier. It's definitely Wednesday. <laughs> um, but yeah, the Climate People and MCJ teams are super thrilled to have 1.5 with us here today to talk about future-proofing your career. I'm going to let them introduce themselves a little bit more in a few minutes, but yeah, just wanted to say thank you and that we're so grateful to have you here. If you were in last month's session, this session is a great follow-up on Drew's session, just speaking a little bit more on making your job a climate job and really talking through that sustainability element. So going to pass the floor over to the 1, the 1.5 team and let them take it from here, but thanks again. We're super excited to have you all. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us, uh, MCJ and Climate People. Um, really great. We super enjoyed putting together these slides together. Um, just as a forewarning, there's a lot of dense content. Um, so be prepared to be looking at a lot of information on these slides. Um, but this information, um, we'll try to find a way to get this all to you so you can see the deck and all the takeaways as well. We'll have a, a set of takeaways at the back end of um the presentation which will give these i guess playbooks and um uh you'll you'll, you'll see anyway um i guess to introduce myself i'm founding partner at 1.5 um, my pronouns are he him his um, my passions are around nature-based solutions emerging biodiversity approaches enterprise decarbonization and net zero um also unsubscribing from mailing lists um, is a big passion of mine as well um, I'll pass it over to Neil to introduce himself and a little bit about 1.5, and then we'll jump into some content. Yeah, my name is Neil, I'm a student founder of 1.5 based out in New York, I'm originally from Australia. I love people and seeing their potential being uh, seen in the best way possible and moving people into the climate field. I also love uh, nonfiction books and Pomodoros for 25 minutes, five minutes off for focal points, which is our team's motto. <laughs> and how we build this content. Well, I don't need to tell you all, it is getting hot in here and we have a Slido to kick us off. So if people haven't used Slido before, we have a QR code. We'd love for you to hop on or you can go directly at slido.com. Um, we'd love to fill this out. Um, it's like, where are you looking to take a climate journey? Don't worry, it's completely anonymous. So we will not <laughs> share this information, but we'd love to see what your thoughts are. If you're already working in a sustainability team, looking to switch jobs, Matthias and I have done the corporate job to climate. And I think many people have before. <laughs> but let's see what sort of pops up. Give it a minute or two. Yeah, looks like we're in a field of people who are kind of like us. <laughs> uh, Matthias and I used to work for the big fours uh, at some point in time, um, fun times. Oh, interesting. Okay, there's a lot of others and we'd be interested to sort of see that and I'll be obviously open to the chat, uh, which is open as well. So if you, if you have some nuances that you want to express on the other front, we're happy to take a look. I'll just give another second, but yeah, it looks like a lot of people are trying to switch. Um, and I think this is useful information, FYI, that we're teaching you today, regardless of whether you're in a corporate job or not. I think the great thing about net zero is it applies to anyone working at an institutional level. And so we can start to hop for, yeah, like, <laughs> big four alum. <laughs> great. Well, why don't we move on? Because I think this will take up a chunk of time. Um, we don't have to tell everyone here, but I hope if you know greenhouse gas accounting, we're in a very dangerous place as a glo globalization. We're at severe sustainable growth is at severe risk with a more than four degrees Celsius warming. I think this year was one of the warmest that we've seen. And what we're trying to do, and this is by the IPCC, the 2015 Paris Treaty, is to draw down uh, down to the 1.5 pathway. Like how do we make sure that public and private sectors are able to not only decarbonize, but also see sustainable growth. And so in some senses, we, we kind of came up with this idea at 1.5, we're an advisor in a training company and the climate space to try to help people move along the pathway. So we need to decarbonize, but also to benefit from sustainable growth, right? And in our opinion, there's like five steps to it. And no one's really kind of said, 
clearly, like, how do you start and end net zero? Like, there's always this confusion around it. And I hope that by the end of this sprint of an hour, you'll have much more of a good idea of what entails within that. So there are a checklist of things that you need to look at. Everything from what is net zero and science-based targets, which we'll go through. What is GHG accounting, both at the organizational level and the product level, the reporting that's evolved in it, the decarbonization, and the skill sets that you need to succeed. So what we've done is we really wanted to make this value driving for you. We've kind of extracted six points and we do have takeaway slides that we definitely want you to be able to use and reference either in your current jobs or your future roles um, across these key areas. So rather than saying it all, we will kind of walk through this one by one between Matthias and I. So first thing is let's talk about the sustainability sector and the jobs. Um, right now, I think the most exciting thing is that sustainability managers have been the biggest hire uh, even more so than clean energy jobs in the last five years. There's a huge amount of demand for sustainability managers right now. And that is all across different organizations, even from climate tech startups all the way to the corporation and government level. There is more and more roles that need to be hired for this. Uh, we went ahead and we know we need you. So that's, that's one thing about this field is, especially if you're anywhere in working with an institution, this is for you. We looked at the 2023 Green Skills Report by LinkedIn, it was very, very interesting. So there's three key insights that you should know as of 2023. One is the gaps for skills, green skills is actually widening by 2x. So even though the talent pool has only been growing by 12%, whilst the job postings requiring green skills has grown by 22.4%. And even in 2023, where we've seen a bit of a drop in hiring, even in the green space, it's still outpacing the growth of talent. And what LinkedIn actually found based on their hiring data is that if you do have some green skills, like what you're going to learn today, it actually gives you a 29% higher chance of getting hired into a clean job role. So we're really seeing that it has to go beyond just like education and understanding of climate sciences. We actually need to know how to do the work. And so what is that work as a sustainability professional? Where again, there was a Microsoft BCG report that just recently came out that targeted the top five skill sets that you actually need as a sustainability professional. If you look at the top five, can you imagine one person having all these skills? Like you're looking at data collection and modeling, which requires quantitative skills, all the way to the other broad spectrum of broad stakeholder management, which is more like change management and governance. What this shows is that, you know, the skill set you need as a sustainability professional is quite multidisciplinary. And also, it also shows that not one person may have all these skills. So when you're in a day in the life of a sustainability professional, how do you toggle between a bespoke emissions model at a detailed data level and having to like tell other people to do this work when they don't understand it? And so this is just where it hopefully outlines areas and gaps that you might have or areas that you already have specialty in that can help you enter into these sustainability teams. And looking at this a bit more deeply from the sustainability leader side, more than two thirds of sustainability managers are actually currently being hired internally. So and then we say every job is a climate job, it's actually not the case in our field. It's kind of a bit biased towards people who already have the experience or they come from non-sustainability spaces. Um, and part of the problem is that less than half of them have any sustainability background and skills. And so, uh, I mean, background. So we have a huge gap even at the leadership level. And if you look at that one level deeper, a lot of these sustainability managers, yes, some come from sustainability backgrounds technically, but there's also a lot that come from the operational roles within a business. So we've actually found when we work with clients mid-tier, even to Fortune 500, we're having to even educate some of the CSOs, the chief sustainability officers about like how this works. <laughs> and so this is not just a problem at entering into the job phase, but it's also an issue at the top end. Like basically uh, greenhouse gas accounting is as mature as financial accounting was in the 1930s, just to give you an indication. And this field of sustainability professionals has only really come up in the last 10 years. Like CDP, science-based targets, these standards have only been around for 10 years. Like how quickly has education institutions been able to keep up with the knowledge required for our industry? They haven't. And CSOs, if like, for example, a greenhouse gas accounting standard changes, which is right now happening for scope three, how does a chief sustainability officer keep up to date with that, you know? So there is like this need for upskilling constantly, not at all parts of seniority. And if you actually look at what sustainability 
professionals do on a day-to-day -day basis, you can see that it's actually split pretty evenly across the areas of strategy, implementation, and enablement. In fact, a lot of the work is implementation and enablement. So this is a survey, by the way, with more Fortune 500 companies, so this might look different for mid-tier companies. But can you just sort of see where some of the biggest pieces lie, right? Data measurement and disclosure and change management is more than a fifth of the job. And that's actually pretty true if you look at it. Like change management is basically getting everyone on board, almost educating, building the governance, because this whole field is new, and having to navigate an organizational structure that shouldn't have been designed for sustainability in the first place. Like my gut feel is that we shouldn't have chief sustainability officers, that everyone, like the chief, the CFO, the CEO, COO, should all have interlays within sustainability, but we have to just tack this on. And the data management side is huge because capital data for what we use for business does not translate well one-to-one -one for emissions data, which hopefully you also see as we show shortly. So we're having to build these new data metrics and ways to collect information to not only act on climate, but the leadership required to execute on it. And if you look at it in terms of what people are asking for, there's, there's a lot that's going on. And so this is one uh, study from EY just showing where the demand is for sustainability needs and gaps. One big place you wouldn't be surprised of is energy transition needs. Probably one of the biggest sustainability goals out there is 100% renewables, just because solar and wind is so prominent now. Like it is a part of the decarbonization plan of an organization. So there's a lot there. There's also a lot within the risk space. So you see this word called TCFD, which we'll cover shortly, which is from the Task Force of Climate Financial Risks and Disclosures. It's probably the most wide leading global standard on climate risk. So imagine everything from natural disasters that hit your stranded assets to transitioning to a climate future. It's been driven by the financial sector, but has been one of the most adopted standard reporting requirements out there. And so there's a lot of questions around how do you actually evaluate you know, whether risk on my portfolio of like, I don't know, real estate or manufacturing facilities across X, Y, Z. So we're seeing a lot of this happening. And there is spend that's happening. And I would sort of say that spend is across the board for a field that is looking for jobs. Companies are spending and they're spending quite a bit of money. And I think this will actually start to come hopefully down in price in some areas because of technology like GHG accounting platforms allow for a more nuance, but if data is the issue, that's why you need you know, people. I, I like to say that QuickBooks didn't get rid of accountants. So therefore uh, these GHG platforms are not gonna get rid of people who know how to do GHG accounting. There's a lot of nuances there. Um, we also have scenario risk management and even in the investment side. So there is spend going into this, even coming into a recession potentially next year, we feel that climate jobs will be very robust because of the amount of government and private spending and even better valuations and investments in now more better value climate tech companies. But coming back to our field, we went through and looked at all the corporate sustainability job roles out there and pulled out some of the top skill sets that you need to get employed. And if you look here on the left side, like I, you know, I came out from Yale and I did the mid-career masters of environmental management, no shade, fantastic program, but too academic and honestly only learned about 5% of what I needed for my current role. There are, there are practical skill sets that you need, like actually knowing how to do greenhouse gas accounting to life cycle, life cycle analysis modeling or ESG frameworks or carbon calculations, like a lot of these roles ask for familiarity. But if you're not someone that has already access to the field, where do you get this from? The problem is that you can't. It's really hard <laughs> because on the one hand, either organizations are hiring from the same talent pool, which we know is not enough. The university curriculums are too academic. I can put my hand up to that and not practical to industry. And online content is just too broad and honestly overwhelming. Like if you wanted to read the 250 page standard on science-based targets, like honestly, go ahead and please do, do, do that. But how do you actually navigate what's applicable to industry? And so... That's why I feel like there's a lot of people left out of the, the job market. And that's what we're trying to change from a mission standpoint from 1.5, but also why we are bullish on running these kind of programming. So going back now to another slide, though, where have you found your sustainability skill sets and experiences? Um, maybe I can reword this, but where have you sort of found informational sources? And this will be a word cloud, so you can choose anything here, but where have you sort of found your greatest sources of skill set knowledge and experiences? I'll give a moment for people to type in. It can be anywhere from podcasts to, yeah, uh, online education platforms. Yeah. Yeah. Terra.do is fantastic. We love them to bits. They have been such a great 
kind of course provider on the, the course materials for general learning, webinars, okay, conferences, papers. And actually doing the work is really key. That's actually where you learn. But if you have the opportunity to do so, that's great. But we get so many internship applications, which is also an issue because they're trying to get those skill sets. Yeah, so there's a lot of online research, climate-based. Yeah, we know them well, teaching. That's amazing. Um, half price books. <laughs> I love that. Oh my goodness. We need to use AI tooling to collect, I don't know, dovetail and, and, and aggregate information in an easier to address way. We love AI tooling. LinkedIn follows, yeah. So they're coming from a wealth of areas. And mind you, these are all fantastic areas. We see certificates here, online training, books, classes, people, conferences. I mean, this is all where people come from. And it's really hard even and overwhelming to sort of absorb this all. So great, I'm loving this. <laughs> well, I hope that we become one of your reference tools and we're really bullish and in, in to be able to sort of dive into some knowledge just coming up. All right, cool. Alrighty, we'll move on. I'm having too much fun looking at this word cloud. I'm going to pass it on to Matthias to now cover net zero for us. Yeah, thank you so much, Neil. Um, yeah, that word cloud was pretty fascinating as well. Great to see MCJ coming out through the middle. Um, you guys are doing fantastic work. So great. That's uh, a central resource. Um, so let me talk about um, net zero and what it means at a global level, because this gives us a frame in which we think about um, corporate sustainability. Um, and that's also a way to think about what startups are providing services to that space to address these different gaps we have. So at its core, we're looking at this balancing equation here. On the left-hand side, we've got this current state and net amount of GHG emissions um, at around 55 gigatons of CO2 equivalents per year. Um, and this is anthropogenic, so man-made GHG emissions. And we need to get to the right-hand side of this screen where the goal is really to get this net amount of GHG emissions to zero gigatons of CO2 equivalents per year. And we do that largely by balancing GHG emissions with things like CO2 removals. So with that, you can also see the blue lines are reducing as well. So we see this large amount of reduction each year as we see these abated emissions uh, go down each year and see the amount of carbon removal that's happening in, in purple. Um, that is largely increasing as we scale up various technologies like say direct air capture, for example, we get better at, um, at supporting our forests, for example, and, and making sure we're having quality uh, sort of carbon projects, for example, out there. Um, next slide, please. And so we look at the history of sustainability in a certain way. We have these four sort of shifts that we have identified. Um, it goes from this 1856 uh, time period up to today. And they are these four different ships we like to group into discovery and investigation, establishing standards, establishing goals and targets, and this consolidating, converging, catalyzing action piece, which is where we are at today. Um, and you can see that yellow line that's coming through at the bottom here. This actually highlights the parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, um, going from 278 parts per million um, doing pretty fine at that stage. Then we have the industrial revolution, of course, then we have, of course, oil and gas, um, starting start to uh, permeate through our economy as well. And then we get to where we are today, around 420 parts per million CO2. So let's go into how these shifts uh, sort of are, have been seen. So we want to start off with uh, Eunice Foote. So you might have heard about Eunice Foote here before. There's actually no known photo of her. This is just a depiction of her um, hard at work on her typewriter, I'd imagine. Um, and so she mentioned in 1856, she theorized that changes in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere could affect the Earth's temperature. Um, her actual paper, which you can see reference here on the right, circumstances affecting the heat of the sun's rays, was presented in August 1856 at a meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and then published. But this scientific paper was actually quickly forgotten and she's faded into obscurity until now. This as I mentioned, not even a known photograph of it today, but this is where the first discovery of global warming happened. So this is the first real shift that we see. Then we move to 1989. And this is actually when the Exxon Valdez oil tanker spilled nearly 11 million gallons of oil into the pristine Prince William Sound off Alaska's coast. Uh, this is an Exxon tanker here you can see on screen. Um, this actually affected 1300 miles of coastline, enormous impact. 
But what happened after this was that uh, Ceres, or the Coalition for Environmentally Responsible Economies, now called Ceres, uh, was put together, led by a bunch of investors that wanted to create a nonprofit profit organization to drive change in this space. And Ceres then set up and co-founded what is called the Global Reporting Initiative, or GRI, um, which set the standard for corporate disclosure and reporting and is now mainstream practice used by over 13,400 companies. Um, and that is the birth of sustainability reporting as we know it. Next slide, please. Then we get to the next phase that we believe is incredibly important, the establishment of um, these global, global frameworks that are out there. And so on the screen here, we have Mark Carney on the left-hand side and Michael Bloomberg, and you might have uh, heard about these names before. These guys, as part of the Financial Stability Board, or FSB, formed something called the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, or TCFD, which is what Neil was highlighting earlier before. So this happened in 2015. And then from this point on, we started to have these uh, large amounts of uh, sort of uh, large amounts of efforts tied to companies that now are able to disclose information designed to help investors, insurers, lenders, better assess climate related risks and opportunities. This helped drive capital towards more sustainable investment. And this was really around four different areas. They have a framework with these four different areas. One, governance, two, strategy, three, risk and four metrics and targets. And these were all collated uh, through a bunch of experts. And now these are the standards that actually permeate through the existing standards that we see coming out today. And now we shift to today. Next slide, please. And what we're seeing here is this shift, this catalyzing of action, this consolidating of all of these sector coalitions coming together to drive forward change. Now we've got things like the launch of the Glasgow Financial uh, Net Zero Association or the Race to Net Zero that was launched. The International Sustainability Standards Board was launched as well. Um, and we also have something related to the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, um, EFRAG, great acronym. Um, they published the first corporate uh, sustainability reporting disclosure proposal and it was passed into law. This is fascinating. So from the Exxon uh, Valdez oil spill, 1989, to 33 years later, we were able to get sustainability reporting into law. Now that is a really, really short amount of time relative to the accounting, uh, the accounting practice, right? It's roughly where the 1930s were in terms of accounting, but we have a lot more to go. So we're going to uh, then go back to this net zero space. So Right now, this shows this frame of net zero, um, and this was part of the Paris Agreement, part of this uh, TCFD timed uh, sequence of events. Now, net zero has created a target for organizations to snap to. Now, there's lots of different pros and cons of this approach, but we believe that it at least gives a north star for organizations to snap to. Next slide, please. And so at the moment, what we're seeing is net zero commitments are increasing at the global level. What we can see here is about 197 parties represented that have uh, something, at least a net zero target in a political pledge, if not in a policy document, if not in law. Um, and right now, this is covering a large amount of emissions, but we can do better. When we look at the company level, next slide, please, we can also see this happening. So science-based targets, uh, initiative is a uh, framework that's out there that allows you to set up short-term and long-term targets for your net zero targets. And what we're seeing here is there's a lot of companies that have submitted SB, uh, science-based targets or SBTs. Uh, and at the moment, we're seeing this incredible increase, this hockey stick growth of this. We've seen 131% compounded annual growth rate in companies committing since 2015. And as of just... Uh, Halloween, I guess, about 6,511 companies that have cumulatively taken action. Now, this is not perfect. Next slide, please. You'll see there's still a gap in getting these approvals uh, through these approved targets. So there's one, a, a gap in 
uh, sort of expertise and knowledge. But there's also a, a gap still in, in this uh, organizing body here. They're getting a huge bottleneck of applications. So we can see that 60, uh, 65, uh, 6,511 targets have been submitted, but only 3,730 have been actually approved. So there's still a gap that we're seeing through these companies submitting these targets. Next slide, please. And so what we need to do right now is set up these net zero commitments today and get to this emissions pathway. So by 2030, as a, as a collective at the global scale, we need to get to 45% emissions reduction and we need, then need to get to net zero by 2050. And there's sort of two leading bodies that overlap with net zero commitments, science-based targets, which I've mentioned, and also the carbon disclosure project, CDP. I'm going to talk you through a couple of these key frameworks that are useful to understand. So we move to the next slide. So when we look at science-based targets, there's an ability to contribute through uh, this four-step framework here. So first of all, we have to set these near-term science-based targets, usually from five to 10-year uh, periods of time from your baseline today, in line with these 1.5 degree pathways. Then we need to set these long-term science-based targets um, to help with uh, aligning with this 1.5 degree scenario, making sure that we have uh, this no later than 2050. We can then look at what is recommended, which is step three, and it's certainly important, but we can look at beyond value chain mitigation. And so companies should really be taking action to mitigate emissions beyond their value chains. Um, and, and this is uh, highlighting purchasing of high quality, and I repeat high quality jurisdictional ready plus credits or investing in direct air capture and geologic storage. Now, these are certainly still nascent in carbon markets, for example, and technologies, but it's still important to look at this, your beyond value mitigation. And then finally, step four is neutralization of residual emissions. So say you've, you've got your long-term science-based targets, um, and you'll have this residual amount of emissions, as you can see on the right-hand side, this graph, this purple section here, these are your removals that you need to be counterbalancing your existing emissions such that you get to net zero along this 1.5 degree pathway as well. Next slide, please. So when is net zero really reached? Well, as we can see, we have the base year, which I've talked about here that you set up. Um, and you set up your, so the S1, S2, and S3, it's scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. That's what's included. And we're moving to this net zero target year, which you can see this grayed out section here. That is all the abated emissions. So the emissions that you're not uh, uh, sort of abating, uh, that you're not emitting anymore, as well as your residual emissions that must be neutralized for this net zero uh, sort of carbon dioxide removal section in purple. And so two conditions need to be met, namely, Scope one, two, and three emissions have been have been reduced to zero or to a residual level in line with this 1.5 degree scenario or sector pathway. And then two, the organization neutralizes any of these residual greenhouse gases in the atmosphere at this net zero date and thereafter. Next slide, please. All right, so that covers the initial sort of set, uh, scene setting of net zero. But I've mentioned a couple of these acronyms. We call it the alphabet soup. Um, I'm going to give you a little brief overview of these regulations and this alphabet soup of climate reporting and disclosures. So at the moment, we actually do have climate laws and policies, right? You can see this global map here that shows uh, the range of how many climate laws and policies are on the books. We can see places uh, like in South America, for example, in Brazil, we have 50 plus climate laws and policies on the books here. Um, but you can also see places like in Africa, for example, where there's only one to 10 of these. So there's a, a large range of these uh, national policies that are in place, but it gives a good uh, sort of picture, a snapshot of where we are right now from a regulation standpoint. But regulation actually matters. If we head to the, the next slide, we can see that the impact of CO2 without laws versus with laws is pretty significant. On the left-hand side here, you can see this gap between the dotted line and the dashed line as well, um, looking at the world. And if you look at the EU and OECD areas, we also see that difference as well. So between 1999 and 2016, climate laws reduced aggregate absolute emissions by 38 gigatons CO2. 
And this reduction really roughly equates to about five to nine percent of the carbon budget. This is certainly positive, but there's certainly room to improve, but it shows the role of regulation. Now, mandatory climate disclosures have entered the chat and they're coming. Next slide, please. So when we look at the, there we go. When we look at this map of the world, we can see these uh, permeate, permeating disclosures. You can look at the sort of where Brazil is, for example, um, IFRS and the sustainability climate disclosures that are coming from that are being integrated into all these different reporting regimes. We see that connecting to places like Canada, UK, we see it going to Japan, we see it going to Singapore, New Zealand and Australia. Um, and in Europe, we have the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, CSRD, and the EU taxonomy. So we're starting to see this convergence of the various standards out there. And what we're seeing is this standards as standardization as people have figured out what the generally accepted principles are of climate reporting. Um, now, this is a great, uh, yeah, next slide. This, this is a great move because what it does is actually change the math of companies actually acting in this space. So there was a rising tide of legislation. I saw a, a comment about the SEC just in the chat there. Um, so we do have uh, about 10,000 plus companies uh, that will be subject to California's historic proposed climate related financial risk regu regulations. With the SEC climate disclosures, these are being delayed. Um, there's a lot of discussion around scope three still, but about 6,000 or so U.S. publicly traded companies and foreign investors will be subject to these uh, climate disclosures. And with the CSRD, about 50,000 companies are impacted here. For companies that are doing business in the EU, they're covered by this legislation as well. So it's not a matter of when, uh, if, it's a matter of when, which is uh, certainly going to change a lot of this landscape. So what is that landscape? Next slide, please. When we take a look, how do you actually choose the right sustainability reporting standard and framework for a, a given company? Well, a lot of these standards and frameworks are actually complementary and fulfill different purposes. For example, the greenhouse gas protocol, um, as you can see in the top left-hand side, is a really broad uh, standard that's being used across, and this integrates into a lot of these different uh, frameworks out there. So the greenhouse gas protocol is how we actually account for carbon. Um, and that's how we find guidance for scope one, two, and three emissions accounting. Um, we can see science-based targets there as well. Um, we, we see CDP. Now this is in a climate uh, sort of environment. It's a focus on the environment sort of space, but it does cover a lot of broad multiple stakeholders. If we look at uh, more of the investor lens, we can see that TCFD, um, TNFD, which is a similar type of framework, but focusing on nature and biodiversity, um, and then we'll also see the SEC as well. These are all focused in the nature of sort of climate environment space, but have a narrower sort of set of audience. So this is mainly investors. And then we can also see um, when we take a look at the, the right-hand side of this quadrant, you were looking at more broader environmental social governments or ESG frameworks out there that highlights uh, different use cases for that audience as well. So when you're thinking about which frameworks to consider, which standards to consider here, it's really about one, what's the type and size of your audience? What is the des desired scope for reporting? Are you doing just climate? Are you doing the environment broadly, climate and nature and biodiversity? Um, are you also looking at specific regions as well, right? And so these are a great way to figure out which of those right standards or frameworks would you need to use? Right? And if you're building a climate tech startup within the accounting space, thinking about which market you're looking to deploy your solution to, um, this is a really handy guide to figure that out. Now, next slide, please. We've got a great slide which uh, sets up, for example, a TCFD aligned climate disclosure. So as I've mentioned before, it's split into these four different areas of, of governance, strategy, risk management, metrics, and targets. Um, and that we've actually brought in the different areas that you need to assess um, what this is uh, going to do in terms of reporting and disclosure. So you can actually see there's some great overlap with all these different standards and how you can incorporate them together. So for example, TCFD really takes care of the governance piece, but no other standards or frameworks are, are used for those areas. Um, but then we see the strategy piece, you, you see some overlap with for example, emission targets and reduction strategies, you're gonna use greenhouse gas protocol. You might also use science-based targets here, 
but you also might use GRI. When you look at risk management, GRI is really covering things like identifying and assessing climate risks. But when you look at identifying physical and transition climate risks, you're also looking at TCFD. And metrics and targets, you can also see some overlaps and also gaps in these different frameworks. So you're likely to figure out what is your audience? What reporting do you need to do? How do you actually assess your business and what's available from a data perspective? What can you actually report on? And then what standards do you need to comply with and what are voluntary? And then you can figure out which standards you should use as part of the alphabet soup. So that's an overview of the alphabet soup and reporting landscape at the moment. It's 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 moving really quick and changes you know every three to six months. Um, but hopefully that gives you a guide where you can uh, work through the alphabet soup. You'll have these slides as takeaways as well. So you can take this as a handy guide going forward, which hopefully will allow you to embed yourself within your company's activities if you're uh, sort of looking at uh, getting engaged with your existing net zero strategies within your existing company. If you're looking at startups that are in the corporate sustainability space, this is a great way to, to figure out what are the companies that are focused on these different standards. I'll pass it back over to Neil okay. to cover this final yeah. session. Cool. We are trying to make you experts by making you drink from a fire hose. So please, like, if you have further discussion points, we can answer as much as possible. You can connect. I've just sent Matthias and my like LinkedIn, and you can ask us any questions. We're very passionate about this space. I just wanted to say we're doing our best. <laughs> um, so the first thing is that a better company measures its emissions, the more effectively it can reduce it. Sounds really simple, right? But what is this GHG accounting thing? I was always asking the question. I didn't even learn. GHG accounting was only introduced at Yale like two years ago, so I missed that boat. But we're here to try to demystify it for you, so at least you understand the basics. So Matthias talked about the science-based targets. It's a five-step approach, and I think one of the steps that's really important for GHG accounting is when you develop your emissions reduction target. You need to know what your baseline is, which is what are you emitting right now based on the time frame that you're looking at it. So that's where greenhouse gas accounting has been set up and the scope three standards are getting updated right as we speak, which just shows how rapidly this is changing. But it's split up in three different areas. So if you've seen this diagram before, I'd highly recommend hopping onto GHG protocol. There are scope one emissions, which are the direct emissions an organization has from their own facilities, their offices and distribution centers. Scope two is related to energy, steam and heat and cooling. And then scope three, which is a big piece, is a bunch of different things which we'll go through, which is both the upstream and downstream of the value chain of an organization. And that's where a lot and the majority of emissions lie. And the combination of all three creates basically an annual greenhouse gas accounting statement. But why would you want to even do this first? Well, first and foremost, when you measure things, you can actually identify where the hotspots actually are. If another consumer brand tells me I should recycle more or use glass over plastic, I generally go, well, where's the measurement to that? Because depending on the value chain, if you have glass that travels by the airplane across continent, it's actually much, much more emissions intensive than you know something like plastic. So there's a lot that needs to be considered and we need to measure it to reduce it. Right. And that also helps an organization to reduce. We found that industries and sectors have very particular emissions hotspots, but each company's value chain is different. And that's why we need bespoke customization done by hopefully you all to help do that. We also need to understand where the baseline is to reduce emissions. And that's where a lot of greenwashing can occur. Like when is that baseline year? <laughs> Are we going to attribute historic emissions, which some companies have, like I think Microsoft has agreed to reduce all the emissions that they've had to history. We also need to invest into the right carbon projects, share the progress through the reporting side that we're improving over time, and the reporting to regulators where required by the law. And so there is this whole process. I'm not going to go through it, but we've kind of broken down GHG accounting into 12 bespoke steps. And so everything from identifying the sources, collecting data, which is the biggest, biggest thing. Mind you, it's the reason why the, I, I shouldn't call out any GHG accounting platforms, but it's the reason why GHG accounting platforms are struggling right now is because data itself is really hard to sort of collect at scale in, in a way where organizations are set up for and to accurately calculate emissions. You should always use activity data first and foremost before financial data. And that's why, you know, financial dollars don't really work and I'm happy to dive into that and then you apply emissions factors you calculate it and then you report on it 
And what the outcome is, is this final product, which is a GHG counting inventory. If anyone knows finance or accounting, it's almost like a profit state, like a profit loss statement in some senses. You have these line items that kind of outline what the different elements of the emissions are from your direct emissions. You have them in an annual basis. So you can see how this is like FY17 and 18 from Microsoft. And then the list of emission sources. Scope 3 has 13 different categories, which we'll show with you. And a lot of the times, just to let you know, and this is where greenwashing can occur, right now companies can actually choose which of the 13 scope three emissions categories they can feasibly me measure and not measure other elements of it. It's, it's a huge issue right now. And it's because it's pretty difficult. It, some companies spend millions of dollars just to calculate their scope through emissions. Because you, imagine you're having to even contact, say you're a fashion brand in the US and you wanted to measure your scope through emissions. You might need to calculate your you know, fabric manufacturer in the Vietnam and ask them to give you bespoke data on their energy usage and their emissions when they are a mom and pop store that you know, may collect data on pieces of paper. So the data collection issue is huge when it comes to scope three. So really, if you understand this better, you can see whether a company is really attributing all the emissions that they have. And why is this important? Well, if you look across the different sectors here on the left, there's two things to sort of see. Scope three emissions are huge, right? Scope one and two is like, easy to do, but it's a fraction of the emissions, even across all different sectors. That's one. The second thing is different sectors have hugely different footprints and an absolute factor. Energy shouldn't be a surprise with fossil fuels, but it all goes down to IT and all those types of technologies. So when it comes to just understanding this, you really need to understand the proportions of where emissions lie, where scope three is the most, but also make sure that you're attributing the industry correctly. One key example is BP's net zero goal. I don't know if they've updated this, but it excludes basically the use of fossil fuel and it also excludes new drilling activity. So they're basically, if, they're, if you were to look at BP's net zero goal, it probably would be like that big, basically like ignoring like more than 80% of their scope three and calling themselves net zero. So this is why it's really critical to understand this stuff because there is enough like flexibility here that if people remember Enron, you can have creative accounting in our space. That's why we need to have more people trained up to call BS on this stuff. And we re really want you to get you all to be that. And so what are scope three emissions? Well, there are 13 categories and highly recommend you just take a read, like look up scope three. We, we are talking to the person who's heading up the standards updates here, but they are pretty bespoke areas, right? Everything from the purchase goods and services you have to business travel is a big one. So if an organization flies people around, that's also involved. If you have investments, that's also big. So say a company has additional capital and it's invested in different funds, the emissions from that also shows up. Employee commuting, the use of sold products is huge. And this one's particularly huge for like, say something like oil and gas. If you, if you ignore this, you're ignoring basically the burning of fossil fuels which is crazy. And I think a lot of fossil fuel companies are like, well, you know, we're not responsible for that. So when you have like Dubai stating all this kind of stuff, we're going to be net zero by 2050. I would sort of hopefully be able to dive deeper and say, well, what are you getting net zero from? Because that's where we need to drive a bit deeper. So I'll let you, you can look at these in your own time because we don't have much time to go through them. But what I wanted to sort of state is, yes, that's GHG accounting. But if you know finance, you know, financial accounting has three different types of statements. You have the balance sheet, the profit loss and income statement. Don't worry, not going to go through that. But similarly in GHG accounting, you can imagine that scope one, two, three only gives you like one view, right? It just gives you the annual statement. It doesn't give you the full view. And so there are another way to look at greenhouse gas emissions, which is super important and sometimes not as focused on. And what is that? Well, it's actually life cycle assessment. So LCA is represents life cycle assessment. You've probably seen this in circular economy. It's where you follow a material, a product or service from the raw materials all the way to the end of life. So a lot of consumer product brands, if you've ever seen like carbon labeling on your products, they're using life cycle assessment to evaluate the emissions at the product and services level. Because the problem is that the GHG accounting scope one, two, three, if you say, okay, then what's your emissions for your product sold? They can't really tell you that. It's like not the right statement to give you that information. So we need different ways to look at emissions to get the full picture to make better decisions. The benefit also is that LCA goes deeper than just greenhouse gas emissions. They actually provide you other impacts like water depletion, ecotoxicity, and that goes beyond just not beyond uh, carbon, which I think net zero has a lot of criticisms for focusing purely on carbon. 
And so just to let you know, this is governed by the ISO standards. There's the 14,000 series, if you ever look them online. And they set out an approach. It's been around for decades now. It's just not been as popular because it is quite time and energy intensive. There are a lot of uh, solutions coming up now, like Bluebird Climate. We'll show you a full landscape of the solutions that we could find. Um, and you kind of use this four-step process to build this life cycle analysis model, which allows you to basically say, you know, what is the environmental impact of particular products? Like, I don't know, recycled plastic packaging versus like virgin plastic packaging. What would the difference be? You'd do LCA. And then that allows you to target in environmental footprints at that level. And why am I telling you this? Well, sometimes people focus way too much on scope one, two, three and say a company's net zero. I call BS on that because... There are elements of the product level emissions that are important and inform enterprise emissions. So what I mean by that is if you remember, scope three emissions are the upstream and downstream activities, the value chain, right? From raw materials to use. Isn't that sound similar to life cycle assessment from raw materials to end of life? There is an overlap when it comes to scope three emissions that life cycle analysis can also touch on. So, you know, when people say it's really hard to capture all the data for scope three, well, why not also run a life cycle analysis model side by side? You can get data for both, there's synergies there, but they show very different things. And so in order to get a more complete environmental impact of an organization, we need to not only look at the enterprise level, but also the product level. So these are the two kind of biggest uh, ways that we measure for an organization so that they're not missing something. Um, yes. So very, very kind of important. And so the way to distinguish the two, and one is that for GHG accounting, it's the annual statement that you have, right? You do it at an enterprise level for scope one, two, three. It uses activity data first and foremost, then spend data to calculate GHG emissions. Whilst LCA is ongoing GHG emissions from and environmental footprint of the products or services you sell. And that's like calculated um, using the activity data that you can get, the supply chain data you can get. So these are just two different ways to view emissions. Sometimes LCA doesn't get looped into net zero, which we think is a huge loss because it's actually extremely important. It's just harder to do. And so what is the landscape? Again, you'll get these slides, but we have outlined a bunch of the software providers, the services out there, the technical databases. I mean, I'm happy to basically dive deep. We really know this space well, and there's new ones coming up every day. That's part and parcel of the problem. <laughs> Sometimes we're trying to just help organizations choose the right tool. And to be honest, like the first time you do it, it's actually best to have contractors or professionals like yourself do it, like in tandem with a solution. It's just so much time and energy required about this. So that is us. And so that is a lot to go through. I'll just kind of give you a quick synopsis of who we are because you're like, who are these people talking at us? Um, we're 1.5. If you haven't figured out, it's based on the 1.5 degrees pathway that we need to keep under. So we are very much focused on doing the hard work, the emissions, the, tech, the technology, the services, the finance work. The way we work is we have um, our projects teams who are ex-consultants, but much more entrepreneurial. And we're trying to build up this expert network, which we hope that you'll be a part of too, um, to like really deploy on projects based on your expertise, because we need more fractional experts to support us. And so we're kind of a small but humble team based out in New York, but we're very globally and diverse. Um, so we're all around um, and we try to do the best work we can on the advisory side and the training side. And then we have this building kind of community that we're trying to do by training people up to become experts. We used to try to get people who are experts already, but we realized that we actually need to lead with this content first to make people you know, able to actually use their skill sets. Because, for example, a renewable energy expert, if there's any people out there, if you don't understand scope two emissions, it's really difficult for you to like match into the net zero play. So even people already in the climate field need to understand what private sector is. Or if you work for a climate tech startup in carbon dioxide removal, right? You need to understand the carbon markets and where a private company is going to purchase, you know, the dollars for that carbon credit removal. And so we think that this stuff should be common knowledge. And so that's why our commitment and why we're here is to try to actually train and activate 100,000 sustainability professionals. We announced this uh, during New York Climate Week. And, you know, if you have support and partners on this, we, we're so passionate about it. And we're super grateful for MCJ Collective and Climate People just resonating with our mission to get this more out there. And we hope that by upskilling people here on the right hand side, you'll gain more expertise, which allows you to act even in your current job. I want to hop this on. You can champion this tomorrow. That's what I love about this. You don't need to change your climate job. You work for an organization, do it. 
And if that execution will allow us to then share more knowledge and intelligence. Like what we're sharing with you is from probably now 75 projects that we've worked on in the last three years to just help make this more sense. If we cross share this together, then we can all learn together. We can all act together. And so I really believe that we need that sustainable professional professional body, just like, you know, CPAs have their whole professional body. We hope that 1.5 and MCJ and all these climate communities can start to house people who are very passionate at the intersection of business and environment. So what can you do? Well, if you go back to the trends, there has never been a better time to work on sustainability of climate, even with the recession coming up. There are more jobs out there than the talent pool can hold. And this work can be done in your startups, non-climate jobs everywhere. So you can start now, right? And careers in this space are resilient. We're seeing that, and I think we'll still see that next year. There's still a lot of capital. The IRA bill, Europe is pushing in more funding. And so people are constantly looking for talent. And not only will you create a great impact, but you will become more indispensable in your career if you learn green skills. Like it is showing time and time again, knowing this stuff will just make you stronger in whichever role that you have. Whew, we made it. Uh, questions and answers. We are answering it all as we go, but uh, we're 1.5. We're super, super jazzed to have you. And for, for everyone to stick around, we're happy to sort of take any questions either virtually or through um, whichever mechanisms you want, Leonie or Natalie. Awesome. Wow. You guys are champs. What a presentation. Um, as I think so many people are saying in, in the chat, uh, if you haven't checked out the 1.5 Academy, it is amazing. I keep hearing fantastic things. I'm tempted to tempted to sign up myself. Um, and just the learning today has been insane. My brain is fizzing. I feel like I need to go back and, and watch this again when I get my hands on the recording. Um, if you have questions, feel free to chuck them in the Q&A. Um, that might be easiest for us to identify which are most upvoted um, and to track them all because I know the chat is super, super busy. Um, if you want to drop a little early to the next meeting, I think we need to normalize bio breaks. So please feel free to do that. And I just want to say a massive, massive thanks um, to the 1.5 team for just being inspirations in this space and to uh, jumping in today to offer this session. Um, yeah huge huge thanks to both of you it's it's really fantastic to see the work that you're doing and and to yeah. to share your learnings with us absolutely and i can i can do a voiceover on some of these questions that are coming through because i can speak faster than i can type but yeah we don't have a we don't have a youtube channel but we have started to digitize the content we're very bullish we have a partnership with terra.do and we also run climate basis fellowship which is more generalized climate content we're trying to get this more out to the global south like leonie was just we're just talking about it like a lot of this content gets pushed to the us and europe which is great but we're starting to digitize our content so you know if you know people we've had some partners from Coursera and LinkedIn Learning that we're talking to, but we want to make this more open. So YouTube channel is definitely on our premise, but how do we make this piecemeal and exciting to learn? Um, live sessions always benefit a lot more. Yeah, and so that's it. Um, cool. And we also had some other questions, I think, throughout the chat, which we're happy to sort of touch on as well. Um, which we've been answering as much as possible. I think one of the biggest questions was around the greenwashing in our space, which I think we should 100% cover. Yes, science-based targets is not a perfect framework. Net zero is not a perfect framework. And we've seen a lot of greenwashing, to be honest, even submitted and CDP high ratings for companies that we think shouldn't have that rating. And what we're trying to do is to demystify this knowledge so that you can pass through it yourself. Because the more people who are knowledge about this, the less greenwashing that can occur. And so that's why we actually think it's super important. Um, and I think regulations will sooner than later catch up, especially if scope three becomes mandated, which I think it will by 2025 in bespoke areas of Europe and US. We're already seeing companies that before were kind of being loosey goosey about this really doubling down on scope one, two, three emissions calcs. It, it, is, it is definitely happening and people are freaking out, but it also means that there's a lot of work out there. Like we constantly see more and more in this space. Um, we've been asked by our advisors, isn't by training people up to do this, aren't you like creating your own competition? I like to say, well, that's great because I would love to put a middle finger up to traditional sustainability consultancies who honestly 99% of the time just keep this knowledge to themselves. I'd rather put a middle finger up in the industry, raise the sea level of everyone's understanding so we can work on the real stuff right? This measurement stuff, we can't spend next seven years just figuring out how to do scope one, two, three, and argue about how to measure and report the alphabet soup. When we need to get past that, we need to measure, not get people confused and start to decarb. 
Uh, sorry, I get really fired up about that, but it really frustrates the crap out of me. <laughs> um, and I think honestly, sometimes when we talk to other sectors out there, they 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 feel very competitive. Like, why should we share you this stuff? Like, we're happy to be an open book. I'm happy to show you our sanitized emissions models. We have a partnership with Climate Neutral, um, who's now the Climate Project. I think they're rebranding, but we use their BE tool to train people on Scope One Two Three, so you can actually learn how to do it. Because a lot of the training stuff out there is like on Excel and stuff. And it's just not very, you know, conducive to the future. Um, yeah, climate change project. Um, sorry, Matthias, uh, before I start blowing up about our industry, I'll let you cover anything else. <laughs> yeah, I, I think in terms of greenwashing, my my, um, my thoughts would be, we're really focusing on quality, um, but at the same time, we can't let um, perfect be the enemy of uh, sort of done, right? So. That I think is we need progress. We need to take it with a grain of salt as well. But at the same time, we need to be bringing as many people together that are capable, that are embedded into all these different industries and companies um, and, and tech solutions, for example, and work together on quality and integrity. That doesn't happen overnight. The way that I think of things like the voluntary carbon markets, it's sort of like we're at dial-up speeds of the internet. We need to get to broadband. Um, but at the same time, it's the only sim sort of simple financial mechanism that we have at the moment, for example, to bring capital flows to uh, projects in the global south that help to support uh, forests and, and prevent uh, deforestation, for example. Um, but the main thing that we're really debating about is not this binary, no, we shouldn't do it, yes, we should. It's about how can we do it better and how can we do it better than yet last year? So that's what I'd say about greenwashing and, and, and quality as well. In terms of talking about, I think there's a question about improving labor and human rights standards in these reporting frameworks. I think that's a, a great call out. Climate is such a systemic um, sort of problem that it connects to all these different areas. And when you start to look at other frameworks like the planetary boundaries, for example, um, you start to see this interconnected nature. It's connected to biodiversity, it's connected to land usage, it's connected to um, biogeochemical flows, for example. It's also connected to the human elements as well, like who is actually running these businesses and how do we care about uh, these individuals and, and take care of them to make sure that the work that we're doing is not just uh, climate friendly, but it's also just and it's transparent. And, you know, we have uh, you know, uh, minimum standards of how we treat our supply chains. So climate's an interesting uh, way to start. But I think as you get closer uh, to the field, you'll start to expand as well all the different issues that you care about. And I think climate's a great uh, foray into that direction. I think that also creates a good analogy for uh, climate reporting and ESG reporting. Start with climate first because a lot of the stakeholder pressures being driven that way and then permeate out into more ESG. Um, that's what I have to say. So I think we're at time at the moment. Um, so maybe I'll pass it back to Leona um, and Natalie as well. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks for all the questions and the chat and engagement. This has been such an inspiring hour. And thank you to the 1.5 team. If you have any questions, feel free to follow up. We'll try and get the slides to you in the email after this. I know there have been a bunch of requests for that. Um, but see you next month. Have a good one.